Alright, I think we will go ahead and get started here. Let's see if we can get the sound where we want it. You know, you know, first off, good morning. You know, I am Ken Hickman. I'm director of the Yellow Sports Museum. You know, on behalf of myself, our programming and education coordinator, Lou Lazarow, and the rest of our staff, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today. Um, you know, I think we have a, a, a fun-filled day of activities lined up you know, for everybody. Um, obviously, we're going to start out up here, and you know, we'll go down to the museum and the exhibit afterwards. Uh, we'll be back up here for lunch, and then you know, we will give you the behind-the-scenes tour here at the stadium, and then we've set up a campus tour for folks you know, with our line ambassadors, you know, who are you know, our student tour guides here on campus. Um, you know, but you know, before I dive into the lecture, I would just like to thank each of the families that are here today. Uh, we are not able to do projects you know, like you know, Island Penn State or without uh, the help, support, and information that we're able to get, get from all of you. So, yeah, so on behalf of all of us, you, you thank you very much for, you know, for answering our letter, answering our email, phone call, whatever it may have been you know, during the weirdness of the last couple of years. You know, it's, you know, again, it, with, without your help, you know, we're, we're not able you know, to do things like this. So, right, I think if to go ahead and get started, you know, I think we have all of our technology working, which is nice. You know, you know, I'll lead off by saying that uh, I am a Penn Stater. You know, those are very powerful words to anyone who's gone to school here. Uh, they mean a little something different, you know, to every single alum. Um, for Max Peters, uh, a veteran of our track and ski team, he so, you know, graduated in 1942, um, it meant something very specific. Uh, you know, Max served with the 10th Mountain Division. You know, he was recruited to the 10th Mountain because he was an experienced skier in the 10th Mountain was the U.S. Army's first ski-based uh, division. Um, he shipped out for, uh, for York in January 1945, you know, immediately entered the fighting overseas, um, and in, in his four months in combat saw just about every horror that that experience can bring. Um, shortly after the war ended in 1945, you know, he took up his pen and in a letter back to one of his friends here on campus, he tried to describe some of what he had seen. Um, he felt that if he tried to put his experiences into words, it might help him cope you know, with everything that had happened. Um, but he also shared uh, what kept him motivated, what kept him going you know, you know, while he was in combat in Italy. Um, he, you know, he wrote, I suppose I could have said to myself, Peters, you're an American soldier fighting for a great country and a great people. You're fighting for kids to go to school and a college where they can gain knowledge, manhood, mental and moral strength. Yours is a democratic, free way of life where every man stands on his own two feet, looking anyone else squarely in the eye and telling them exactly what his feelings are with the knowledge that if his ideas are right and he truly supports them, he can make them be accepted. Give everything that you have, even your life if necessary, so that others can continue where you left off back there. So that others can feel about democracy and life, you know, you know, the same, same as you do. All these things I could have told myself, but it's much simpler to express the whole thing by simply saying that I am a Penn Stater. Um, so, so who were these Penn Staters? Where did they come from? What was the school that they attended and loved like back in their day? Well, during the course of World War II, over 1,200 of our former varsity lettermen and Women's Recreation Association athletes served in some capacity in the U.S. military, the USO, or the American Red Cross. Um, the oldest, Colonel Frank Keith Ross, graduated in 1908. You know, he was a veteran of World War I, as were several of our older varsity lettermen who saw service in World War II. Um, they served in every branch of the military and, and, and in every theater of the war. Uh, the vast majority hailed from here in Pennsylvania, or at the very least, a state adjacent to Pennsylvania. We certainly were not a national university <laughs> at that point in time. 
The years after World War I, the Salt Penn State, you know, or the Pennsylvania State College, as it was known back then, we were not a university, grow at a steady pace as enrollment increased, new buildings were constructed, you know, and this continued all the way through the 20s until the beginning of the Great Depression. Uh, it wasn't until 1933 that enrollment started to slow, as families were increasingly unable to send their kids to college due to dwindling finances. Uh, to combat this, you know, Penn State was able to obtain federal emergency relief administration funds, which allowed the college to provide part-time jobs and aid students in financing their education. In addition to this funding, Penn State opened a you know, variety of branch campuses so that prospective students could start their college career closer to home and save money you know, by, by living at home. You know, these factors, along with the fact that you know, there weren't, weren't all that many jobs that existed if you elected not to attend college, helped Penn State maintain its enrollment during the worst times, times of, of the Great Depression. <clears throat> you know, you know, as the decade progressed, you know, campus began to grow with funding for new buildings, including the Petit Library, you know, which you know, we'll see later this afternoon. You know, you know, these fell into place, while, and while these projects supported the college's academic mission, you know, a chronic shortage of housing both on and off campus plagued the student body. And, um, it, you know, that'd be you know, hard to realize now given the amount of construction going on downtown, but back, back then this was a big issue. Now, the 1930s also saw a dramatic growth in female enrollment at Penn State. You know, the admission of women had doubled you know, since World War I, and by 1940, we were a whopping 20% female. Uh, you know, lacking varsity sports of, of their own, uh, athletics for female students was handled initially through the Women's Athletic Association and then the Women's Recreation Association. Uh, these organizations provided a comprehensive slate of intramurals and clubs you know, with the goal of offering socialized recreation and skill development. Now, participation in the WRA also could be used towards your physical education credits. You know, we have some you know, wonderful photos you know, from that time period. Uh, you know, athletically, you know, on the men's side, 1920s saw the rapid growth of college football as money flowed into the game and stadiums grew. Um, you're going to sense a trend here that doesn't sound radically different than the last 10-15 years. Uh, this led to an increasing sentiment that college sports were becoming too big, too professionalized, with too much money flowing through it. To address that situation, the prestigious Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching commenced a study on college athletics in 1926. Uh, Penn State was not exempt. You know, from the sporting excesses of that time period. And in that same year, the Alumni Association, which played a major role in athletic administration, formed a committee led by John Beaver White to address the situation. The Beaver White Committee's work coincided with the arrival of President Ralph Hetzel, who took office in 1927. And while not anti-football per se, President Hetzel firmly believed that the game presented a variety of dilemmas and that emphasis on varsity sports detracted from the overall physical fitness of the student body. Um, the Beaver White Committee de delivered their recommendations in 1927 and with Hetzel's support, they were approved by the students and alumni. Um, in addition to moving control of athletics to the administration, it also called for the elimination of athletic scholarships and a creation of a school of physical education as well as eliminating recruiting, training tables, and scouting for, for varsity athletics. So, you know, you know, what was essentially approved in the late 1920s was going from something like we have today to more of a high school model. Uh, in implementing these changes, Penn State thought it was going to be on the leading edge of a revolution in college sports. Uh, unfortunately, despite the scathing findings from the Carnegie Foundation, uh, which was released in 1929, few other schools took Penn State's purity approach uh, to athletics. Um, you know, of course, this led to a dramatic downturn in on-field performance.
performance. You know, for Penn State, you know, as many sports suffered from the fact that they could not recruit, scout, and so forth. Um, you know, as um, you know, as the thirties progressed um, and football losses mounted, our football alumni took matters into their own hands. Um, started covertly scouting, recruiting, uh, finding jobs for players, providing housing. Uh, much to the administration's dismay. Um, and while, I should note that while things in football suffered during this time period, a number of our other programs found ways to excel. Uh, you know, uh, first among them, our men's soccer team went on a nine-year unbeaten run you know, from you know, late 1932 you know, up to early 1942. In that time period, Coach Bill Jeffries' teams won six national titles. Um, they peaked in 1935 when they were both undefeated and did not concede a goal the entire season. Um, you know, track also began to excel and produce an all-time great, Barney Ewell. Um, in Barney's case, uh, he was the latest in a series of outstanding African-American runners that had come to Penn State in the post-World War I period. I you know, feel I need to point out that no sport did more to race than the great Penn State the track, particularly in that time period. You know, Bar Barney was the pinnacle. Uh, yeah. Barney arrived at Penn State in 1938 as the Pennsylvania State Champion in the 100 and 200 meters, as well as the high jump. You know, wasted no, you know, no time converting that dominance in college, you know, winning national titles in the 100 and 200 in 1939-40. Uh, he was widely viewed as the next Jesse Owens. Uh, you know, throughout his career at Penn State, he was a nine-time All-American, won 12 Intercollegiate Association of Amateur Athletes of America championships. I'll say that five times fast. Uh, <laughs> With the American entry into World War II, you know, he left school early you know, you know, to serve in the Army and you know, deferred his graduation. Uh, because of World War II and the fact that the Olympics were canceled in 1940 and 1944, he was never able to achieve the international fame that someone like Jesse Owens did. Uh, he was put on the U.S. Olympic team in 1948. Won two, you know, narrowly lost the gold in the 100 and 200 meters, you know, came home with a pair of silvers, but did get a gold from the 4x100 relay. You know, and through the course of his career, he held five world records. You know, so you know, we always like to point Barney out because he often tends to get overlooked um, by our alumni, but he is arguably one of the greatest athletes Penn State has, has ever produced. So, you know, as we move towards the World War II period, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you know, what we find in the late 30s and early 40s is, you know, two of our students, you know, you know unexpectedly, in some ways, finding themselves involved in, you know, in you know, the Second Sino-Japanese War you know, between China and Japan, which started in 1937. Um, increasingly. You know, you know, historians are looking at this as the real beginning of World War II. Um, but, you know, you know excuse me. <coughs> uh, you, you, you know, the first of you know, the, the two athletes who ended up in China you know, was, was Clark Razor. Um, he had competed here at Penn State as a boxer. He graduated in 1928 and served as team captain. As a senior, led it to a 6 and one record and a team title at the Intercollegiate Boxing Championships. Uh, left Penn State, earned his medical degree at, you know, down at Jefferson in Philadelphia, and then entered the U.S. Navy to serve as a surgeon. Uh, six years later, he found himself serving as a surgeon aboard USS Panay, you know, which was a gunboat serving with the Yangtze River Patrol in China. You know, the goal of the patrol, which had been there you know, for uh, about 40 years, was to protect American interests, you know, people, and property you know, in China. And as the war with Japan began, you know, the gunboats of the patrol were sent to protect American interests and evacuate American citizens along the river valley. Uh, 
on December 12, 1937, you know, and while fulfilling this role, you know, Panay came under attack by Japanese aircraft. Um, this occurred despite the fact that there were three large American flags displayed on the vessel. The U.S. Navy had informed the Japanese that that vessel was operating in that area earlier in the day. Despite this, it was struck by two bombs and machine gun by Japanese aircraft. As it, you know, as it began to sink, you know, the crew abandoned ship. You know, Clark Razor, as the surgeon, was central to the evacuation efforts, caring for the, the crew both as they evacuated and once, you know, once they reached shore. When the fighting ended, you know, three Americans were dead and 43 were wounded. Uh, and if we, if we look at the photo up here in the lower right, the fellow leaning over on the right side of the photo is, uh, is Lieutenant Grazer, you know, attending to the wounded. Um, while the sinking of the Panay triggered a major international crisis, neither the U.S. or Japan were eager to go to war at that moment. Japanese continued to insist that the attack was unintentional and the issue was settled with, with Japan paying about a two and a, about two and a half million dollar indemnity to the United States. Uh, for his actions during the attack on the Panay, a Clark Razor received the Navy Cross, the U.S. Navy's second highest decoration for valor. Uh, when war ultimately came, you know, he, he had remained in, in the Navy and served in U.S. Naval Hospitals in Australia and New Guinea. Uh, the other Penn Stater who found themselves in China before Pearl Harbor was State College's own Emma Jane Foster. Uh, and she was the daughter of our town doctor here in State College. Um, those of you who are a little more local, you know, Foster Avenue, a couple blocks back from College Avenue, same family. You know, the house she grew up in is where our firehouse is downtown now. Um, she you know, came to Penn State, <clears throat> you know, having grown up blocks from campus, you know, immediately became involved with the Women's Recreation Association. And in 1935, broke the gender barrier on Penn State study abroad programs you know, by going to China you know, to study at uh, Lingnan University. While she was there, she fell in love with the people, you know, fell in love with the culture, and decided that she wanted to find a way to come back to China you know, after she graduated and, and, and help the people of that country. Um, she left Penn State, got her master's degree in nursing from Yale, and in 1940 was working for a uh, medical group in Minneapolis, Minnesota that was working with disadvantaged folks in that city. With China at war with Japan, you know, the opportunity came for her to go overseas when Claire Lee Chennault, a, a former U.S. Army Air Corps officer, who was forming a, a group of American pilots to go help the Chinese, you know, came recruiting medical personnel. Um, and this obviously is the American Volunteer Group, which I think most of us know as the Flying Tigers. And Emma Jane, because she was fluent in China, was one of two civilian nurses that he recruited to ship out with all of his pilots and ground crew. And she departed in the summer of 1941 with most of the Flying Tigers pilots. And during the voyage to Burma, you know, she got her nickname Red, which unfortunately you know, we can't tell from black and white photos, but she had flaming red hair. During the trip out, she was drawn to one of the pilots, a fellow named John Petach, a former U.S. Naval aviator. You know, after the two of them had had a raging fight about classical music. Um, arriving you know, in Burma and then into China, you know, Petach proved to be one of the AVG's most skilled pilots. Um, and despite you know, the rigors of combat flying, his and Red's relationship continued to blossom. And despite the fact that Claire Chennault really, really did not want his pilots fraternizing, he ultimately ended up officiating their wedding in February 1942. Um, I will point out that Emma was, at one point, was not allowed to play poker with the pilots because she was too good. You, you read her letters and she incessantly talks about having a lot of cash that she needs to spend. 
her and Chanel got quite close. Um, she initially was assisting him in teaching aerial tactics, um, helped influence Cl Cl uh, Claire Chanel's thinking on aerial tactics, and then was starting to teach some of those classes herself. Both Red and John remained you know, with the EVG until the Flying Tigers were disbanded on July 1, uh, 1942, at which point John, as everyone else was getting ready to ship home, volunteered to stay for two weeks to help train incoming U.S. Army Air Force's pilots. Six days later, his aircraft was shot down and he was killed. Emma Jane at that point was two months pregnant. Um, completing you know, the trip home to State College, you know, she gave birth to a daughter that she named Joan and Claire in honor of you know, Joan for John the father, Claire for Claire Chanel. Uh, <clears throat> and for the rest of the war, Red her, and her daughter were here at State College. Um, she desperately wanted to get back overseas, but obviously with a small child that was not in the cards. In 1952, they were invited to the first Flying Tigers reunion out in Hollywood, California. And it was brought to everyone's attention that Joan Claire was the only child of a pilot who had been killed fighting in China. Now, at that first reunion, Claire Chanel presented her with a gold medallion you know, that read Sweetheart of the Flying Tigers. And the Flying Tigers alumni served as Joan Claire's surrogate fathers if the rest of their lives, and they made sure that she received a college education and covered the cost. Um, so, I'll say that was one of the most fascinating stories that we found, especially given that it has a very local connection you know, here in town. So, back on campus, while you know, Clark and Emma were running around China, uh, the students and the administration were starting to wake up to the rise of fascism and totalitarianism. <clears throat> You know, you know, both in York and in the Far East. Uh, the conflict in China became a global war on September 1, 1939, with the German invasion of Poland. You know, and while um, students at Penn State did not initially favor American involvement in either the Far East or in Europe, um, this time period did see a renewed interest in ROTC here on campus, you know, which had been a bit looked down upon in the 1930s. Uh, by, by 1941, Penn State possessed one of the largest ROTC units in the country with over, over 1,200 cadets. Now, we also saw on campus as the United States' defense policy began to change, a number of faculty had the reserve officers' commissions activated, so we had faculty starting to leave campus to serve in defense industries. Obviously, and any reservations that Penn State students had about getting directly involved in the conflict ended with the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Um, you know, the Japanese surprise attack had killed over 2,300 Americans, uh, sank or damaged eight battleships, and catapulted you know, our, na our nation into the war. In the early months of 1942, patriotic sentiment on campus obviously ran high. The University of the College began to readjust and reorient itself towards aiding the cause. And beginning in January, a number of volunteer defense classes were offered for, for students. These were things that you could do at night in addition to your normal coursework. For the guys, you know, that was going to be military engineering, marksmanship, you know, other uh, other skills that would help you move through basic training you know, once you entered the military. Um, keeping in mind the time period we're dealing with, you know, the classes for the ladies included cooking, sewing, and waiting tables. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how waiting tables is a defense skill, personally. But I, um, With many students departing to join the military through 1942, the university needed to move to find ways to maintain enrollment. Um, that was done through working with the War Department you know, to bring in 
a variety of military training programs. We had programs on Canvas designed to help train Army Air Force's air crew. Um, the two of the biggest were Navy Marine Corps V-12, which was an officer training program. Uh, another was Army Specialized Training, which was not a degree program so much as the Army sending students here to learn very specific skills. Um, we also hosted, and this was an interesting thing to find, you know, a training program for women who were going to work in, in the aviation industry. You know, these provided basic engineering and drafting skills and originally came about through a contract Penn State did with Curtis Wright Aviation. Uh, the program proved so successful that ultimately additional contracts were brought up with uh, Consolidated Volte and you know, uh, Martin Aviation. And we can actually see them, you know, it's, they have, just like the, the men had a military setup, you know, so they were expected to march to class you know, you know, and be in their own uniforms. Now, at the peak, you know, these programs on campus added 2,600 students you know, to Penn State's enrollment. They were critical in keeping Penn State afloat during the war you know, and remained in place through 1944 until they started to wind down as the end of the war was becoming a little more obvious and the military was implementing their own training programs. Now, obviously, you know, since we're in intercollegiate athletics, a variety of challenges emerged during the war years. Uh, we succeeded in maintaining our full slate of then 17 sports you know, up through 1943. But in 1944, uh, issues with resources and travel and manpower were such that 10 of the 17 were put on hiatus until the end of the war. Uh, the only ones that were retained uh, were football, soccer, boxing, wrestling, baseball, basketball, and lacrosse. Um, the only reason that we were able to even retain those was a role, was a, two rule changes. One allowed freshmen to compete. You know, at this point in time, freshmen were not allowed to be on the varsity team. And the other was that the Navy Marine Corps V-12 candidates were allowed to participate in varsity sports. Um, you know, if you look at records across the country you know, from you know, 43, 44, you will find Schools like you know, Little Bucknell down the road from us, you know, maybe beating Maryland, you know, little schools that, schools that you would never dream of beating someone bigger these days. But they could do it because they had the Navy Marine Corps guys on their team. Uh, this time period saw the very last you know, five-sport letterman here at Penn State, uh, Rowan Tubby Crawford. You know, they were, very happy that we could find photos of him you know, with every single sport. Uh, he had come to Penn State from uh, Wisconsin, uh, earned letters in football, soccer, uh, hockey, uh, boxing, wrestling. Make sure I'm getting everything right. Yeah, football, so I'm sorry, football, soccer, track, hockey, and boxing. Uh, you know, you know, and he did that within nine months on campus. I, I give him a lot of credit. He was an extremely gifted athlete. Coaches would literally come to him and say, hey, do you want to try this? And he, why not? I'm not sure that he had ever ice skated before he came to Penn State and he was on the hockey team. So, good on him. <laughs> so, you know, for those student athletes who had already graduated and were in the military already when the war began, um, it was a particularly difficult time period. We had two former student athletes who were in the Philippines in early 1942 when the Japanese invaded. Uh, Captains Eugene Forker and Elgin Radcliffe you know, were both serving you know, under General Douglas MacArthur in the Philippines. They were among the first to see combat. Uh, Radcliffe d distinguished himself uh, in destroying, he was an engineer, uh, destroying American facilities in the face of Japanese advance. Both ended up as part of the force that had to retreat to, to the Bataan Peninsula near, near Manila. And there they were able to hold out until early April 1942. And when they 
General King was forced to surrender a mixed force of about 80,000 Americans and Filipino soldiers. Both Forker and Radcliffe were able to survive the unrelenting brutality of the Bataan Death March as they were forced to walk to prisoner of war camps in northern Luzon. And in Forker's case, he spent the next 33 months as a prisoner of war at Cabanatuan. Um, during this time, he was able to keep a secret diary of his experiences. Now, in it, he relates you know, the day-to-day -day drudgery of the life of the POW, the beatings by the Japanese guards, trying to avoid various illnesses from dysentery to amoebic, <coughs> I'm sorry, malaria to a amoebic dysentery. Yeah, but he also relates the excitement of first seeing American aircraft fly over the camp as American forces advance across the Pacific. Um, in October 1944, yeah, with Allied forces approaching, a number of the prisoner, prisoners in the Philippines began to be transferred either to what is uh, present-day Taiwan, Korea, or mainland Japan. Um, these transfers were viewed with a great deal of frustration you know, by the POWs, you know, given that American forces were near, they thought their liberation was at hand. Uh, it also, it, these transfers also frightened them because stories had come back to them that you know, these transport ships were being sunk by Allied submarines and aircrafts. He actually notes in the last page of his diary before he was transferred out that he was terrified that they were going to be sunk by their own ships. Uh, on December 13th, you know, he was he and interestingly Radcliffe as well were packed into the hold of the Oroko Maru, you know, along with 1,600 other prisoners of war. You know, the foul conditions on these vessels let them be known as hell ships. And again, you know, these vessels were not marked as POW transports by the Japanese. They just looked like normal merchant ships. Which is how two days later, as that ship moved through Subic Bay, it was attacked by American aircraft. You know, in the attack, you know, Forker you know, was injured, in a, you know, it's believed to have drowned when the vessel sank. Radcliffe was able to get ashore but was recaptured and was liberated a couple months after the war ended you know, from a camp in Korea. Now, interestingly, Forker had left his diary at the, at the camp in Cabanatuan with a note saying, you know, this is who I am, this is my mother's address, if anybody finds this, please send it to her. And somebody found it and sent it to, her, sent it to his mother, and that's how we have a copy of it today. Um, so I think moving forward from here, rather than kind of pursue a chronological approach to things, I'd like to skip around a bit and just hit some of the you know, highlight stories that we found. I'm going to point out that you know, we've kind of deliberately tried to avoid family stories here, because you know those, and we can all talk today and share those. You know, so um, you know, these are you know, some of the other kind of highlights you know, that we've been, a been able to track down. Um, you know, one that is kind of you know, near and dear to those of us on campus, because we have a building named after him, you know, is Garfield Thomas. Now, he you know, grew up down in Edinburgh, you know, in west of here. Came to Penn State in 1934, served as a manager on you know, the, the uh, soccer team, assistant manager, one year manager, you know, the next. Um, as a senior, he managed, as the manager, that team won a national title. Um, when he graduated, he spent a brief amount of time in the coal industry, realized that really was not for him and joined the Navy with the goal of becoming a naval aviator. And he had a little top gun in him way back then. Uh, unfortunately, in his case, he wasn't very good at it, washed out of flight training, and you know, ended up moving, moving over to surface forces and was commissioned in the summer of 1940. Uh, he was aboard the light cruiser USS Boise in the Philippines when the war began. Um, thankfully, you know, Boise was not in the Philippines as you know, fighting developed in that area. Um, in the early part of 1942, his ship you know, was active in the Southwest Pacific. 
and my summer was serving with U.S. Naval Forces off the critical island of Guadalcanal. Now, on the night of October 11, 12, at the Battle of Cape Esperance, you know, which was an American tactical victory, um, you know, Boise sustained you know, two severe hits from the Japanese cruiser Kinugasa, uh, one of which struck you know, right between turret one and two. And unfortunately for Thomas, he had been made the turret captain of turret one, which would be the forwardmost turret on the Boise, the top photo in the center there. <coughs> Yeah, the resulting explosion killed over 100 sailors. Uh, Thomas was badly wounded. But he remained in turret one, making sure his crew evacuated. He was last seen telephoning down to the shell handling room, trying to get those men to evacuate. Um, you know, he, was late, he later died of his wounds and was buried at sea. Um, in recognition of his heroism, you know, you know, he, he did receive the Navy Cross. Uh, in 1944, the U.S. Navy named a destroyer escort in his honor. It's you know, pictured below center there. And you know, as you know, you're around campus, at the far, far end of campus are you know, uh, <clears throat> at our hydrological research facility, Penn State's water tunnel has been named for him you know, you know, since 1949. So, uh, you know, you know, with Jack Reichenbach, you know, we, we always talk about, you know, as Penn State alumni, you find friends and alumni in the strangest places. You can't go any place in the world you know, without seeing a Penn State hat, sweatshirt, t-shirt, what have you. Um, I will say that Jack took that to a very different level. He grew up, up in Bradford, northern Pennsylvania. He came to Penn State, was a star on the basketball team. Uh, was a brother at Beta Sigma Rho fraternity. You know, earned you know, uh, three varsity letters, you know, captain of the basketball team you know, as, as a guard, and was known you know, for his outside shooting ability. Uh, when he graduated in 1938, he played semi-pro ball for a while. It, but also had an interest in aviation. He went and earned his pilot's license on his own. With the beginning of the war, immediately entered the U.S. Army Air Forces. Uh, because he had already had his pilot's license, you know, within about two and a half months, he, he had earned his military wings you know, down at Ellington Field in Texas. Then spent most of the next year or so serving as an instructor in Florida and South Carolina you know, before receiving orders to join the 15th Air Force in Italy. Uh, he served as an operations officer for the 451st Bomb Group, took command of the group's 726th Bomb Squadron in late 1944. On February 7, 1945, while leading the bomb group on a mission to strike an oil refinery in Kornbrauberg, Austria, you know, a 88 millimeter flax shell exploded under the nose of his B-24. And that shell killed their navigator, um, sucked the bombardier out of the aircraft. Um, he amazingly had his parachute on and was clipped in. Um, that individual had no memory of the shell going off, and just woke up on the ground wondering how he got there. Um, you know, Jack and the rest of the crew attempted to salvage the aircraft. Uh, they lost altitude, had turned for home, uh, before realizing that it was too severely damaged you know, to you know, reach Italy. Um, you know, he had the crew you know, evacuate, they all bailed out. When they landed on the ground in Hungary, and the local police rounded them up. Uh, Jack was immediately grabbed because he was Jewish, and they, were, they singled him out for that fact until his crew surrounded him and pushed back the hung Hungarian police, you know, yelling at them that we are all Americans. Ultimately, you know, Jack and the other officers on his crew were sent to Stalag, you know, 7A in Moosburg, Germany, down in Bavaria. 
And he was flabbergasted to find that one of his pledge brothers from Beta Sig was in the hut next to his. Lieutenant Bob Rosenberg had been shot down in September 1943, had been a POW you know, for about a year and a half. You know, here we are, the two of them are in huts next to each other at a POW camp. A couple weeks later, when the camp was liberated in April 1945, the first officer that reached them, you can see the three of them at the bottom there, you know, <clears throat> you know, was Captain Sidney H. Bergman, who had pledged a year after that, you know, here at Penn State. Uh, despite the enormity of the conflict, you know, the war had brought three Penn State fraternity brothers together at a POW camp in, in southern Bavaria. Uh, Rosa, uh, <clears throat> you know, Bergman helped both Jack and Rosenberg you know, you know, reach out to their families. He provided them with extra food while they were processed you know, to be sent back to the United States. Um, Writing home to his wife, Cecily, Jack commented about the whole situation that, quote, it's a small, strange world, isn't it, baby? So, so when we think about World War II, I think few units are perhaps as famous as the Tuskegee Airmen, um, you know, which, you know, you know, in military parlance in Italy with the 332nd Fighter Group. Um, that unit traced its roots back to 1939 in the flight training program that was established at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama as the U.S. Army, which was fully segregated at the time, sought a way to train African American pilots. And the you know, through the war, the Tuskegee Airmen proved to be extremely gifted pilots. You know, both in the skies over North Africa, you know, Italy, and Central Europe. And the training program at Tuskegee continued you know, throughout the war. Among those who helped produce pilots at Tuskegee was Penn State's you know, Irwin Jackson. You know, a track athlete here at Penn State, you know, come here from Philadelphia, you know, you know, excel, excel in track with three varsity letters, while earning a degree in mechanical engineering. When he graduated in 1934, uh, he pursued master's degrees in mechanical engineering and mathematics, and by 1940 had both of those as well as going to law school. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I had that level of ambition. <laughs> um, when the war began, he was an engineer you know, with the U.S. Navy in Washington. Um, he was consulted you know, by the, the Secretary of War's staff on discrimination within the war effort. And in April 1943, left the Navy to enter the Army Air Forces. And with his engineering background, it was sent to Tuskegee to serve as an engineering officer and an instructor. Over the next two years, you know, he served there educating you know, uh, new pilots coming through. You know, it, you know, in the mechanics of flight and how to maintain their aircraft. You know, we can see him in the lower left here, kind of climbing up on the wing to talk to the mechanic. Um, one of the pilots that he helped train you know, was, was, was James Wright. Your Wright had come to Penn State during the war, had been on the boxing team, um, left shortly before he graduated you know, to, you know, to enter the military, and had a very kind of traditional experience at Tuskegee moving through pre-flight, you know, primary, basic, and then advanced training for fighters. Um, in late 1944, you know, he was assigned to the 126th Air Force Base Unit at, at Willowboro, South Carolina, which was essentially a holding unit for pilots who were ready to ship out overseas. Uh, you know, on a flight uh, that November, you know, he and you know, four other pilots, um, he was not at the controls, were flying off Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, in a uh, Lockheed Ventura, when you know, something happened. To this day, we don't know what it was, but that aircraft hit the water with no survivors. Uh, no remains were ever recovered. Um, you know, but you know, if we certainly we value his service, and we are we're just 
you know, extremely proud of the fact that we have a connection to, to such a renowned uh, program during the war. Um, you know, as a note, all of Penn State's African American student athletes um, had very similar wartime experiences to the, as their peers, you know, African American peers. In the U.S. Navy, you're likely were to be relegated to being a steward. In the U.S. Army, you're likely were to be assigned to support services. Uh, this was largely due to a belief in the military at the time that African Americans were not up to you know, combat duty, were not, you know, could not be capable leaders. Uh, one of our other track athletes, Sam Herbert Nipson, uh, absolutely brilliant journalist, uh, was relegated to serving as a driving instructor down at Camp Lee. Um, after the war, became the executive editor of Ebony Magazine and developed it into one of the largest African American publications in the country you know, by 1970. <clears throat> you know, as the war progressed and casualties mounted, uh, more African American units were created, and most had ex extremely distinguished service records overseas. Of course, it would not be until 1948 that the U.S. military was fully desegregated. So, so, you know, so one person that we had to make sure we covered today, because today is September 17th, which is the 78th anniversary of Operation Market Garden, which was a major airborne offensive into Holland in 1944. You know, it is Roy Hammer Jr. Uh, Roy is probably one of our most you know, distinguished and decorated you know, World War II veterans. You know, grew up not far from here, over in Lock Haven. Came to Penn State to study dairy husbandry. Um, <clears throat> was a stalwart on the boxing team during his time here at Penn State. Um, got one third at the uh, Eastern Invitationals in 1938 at 145. A year later, won the title at 135. And in 19th, February 1941, after graduating, had his ROTC commission activated. Uh, completing training, you know, he volunteered for the newly created Airborne, and earned his jump wings with the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment, uh, which is one of the U.S. Army's first Airborne formations. So he was, was a pathfinder you know, in terms of developing that style of combat, and was commissioned as a second lieutenant. Regiment shipped out to North Africa as part of the newly formed 82nd Airborne Division, and he had his first combat drop on July 10, 1943, over Sicily. Um, reading his first-person account of that drop, it was um, not great. It, the operation was bungled you know, to a fairly high degree, and he spent most of the first two days on the ground in Sicily simply trying to find his men and get them gathered up and get back to uh, the American Beachhead. <clears throat> um, that fall proved equally active as you know, his regiment was brought ashore as part of the invasion of Italy on September 11th, 1943. Um, this time they came in on landing craft. Because, you know, that was seen as the more effective way you know, to bring them to battle. You know, and the next two months, Hannah and the 504th, you know, helped helped fight and clear the hill hills north of Slayer, No Italy. Now, the following February, with the Allied offensive in Italy stalled, the 504th again was delivered by landing craft as part of the invasion of Anzio, which was an attempted flanking and run around the Monte Cassino line. While in the Anzio beachhead, you know, Hannah and the regiment saw intense combat. They actually earned the nickname from the Germans, you know, the Devils in the Baggy Pants, because they had baggy jump pants. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and on February 8th, uh, you know, Hannah was ordered to take an attack full. You know, you know, <clears throat> you know, they were moving forward. And towards the German position, he was commanding the company. You know, yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 Excuse me. 
you know, in, in reading his description of the action, he points out they always carried two grenades in, in clipped to his uniform. You know, he you know, pulled one, threw it, and as they were advancing, a rabbit ran in front of them. Rabbit picked a bad place to be. Uh, seeing the rabbit made him turn slightly. And as he turned, he was uh, shot in the chest. He indicated that if the rabbit had not run in front of him, that round would have hit the other grenade that was pinned in his uniform and would, obviously would have killed him. So, um, you know, the, you know, the, the bullet that struck Hannah went through, perforated his right lung. Um, he continued to lead the attack forward until he collapsed from the lack of oxygen. As he put it, he came to, got up, kept leading the men forward, collapsed from lack of oxygen, and did that, he thinks, four or five times before a medic pulled him down. And, um, for, for his heroism in that situation, he received the Distinguished Service Cross, you know, the second highest decoration for valor in the U.S. Army. Um, he was sent back, to, you know, sent back to Naples to recover, then to England when the regiment is you know, shipped out. This day, 78 years ago, he jumped out of the C-47 along with the rest of the 82nd Airborne. Now, their role in Operation Market Garden was to take the bridge over the Wall River in Nijmegen in, in the Netherlands. <clears throat> now, three days after landing, the bridge still had not been taken. Now, the Germans were heavily fortified on the north end of the bridge. And the decision was made to, to try to cross the river in, in, in an amphibious assault using canvas boats you know, to get around the German position. Uh, Hannah was in the second wave that went across. Uh, he said he never paddled so hard in his life. You know, and they were, were able to take the bridge shortly thereafter. Uh, you know, later fought in the Battle of the Bulge in the advance into Germany. You know, came home in August 1945. Uh, in 19, excuse me, 2017, he was honored when, with the 504th Inf uh, Parachute Infantry's Regimental Room at Fort Bragg being named in his honor. He was also named an inaugural member of the 82nd Airborne's Hall of Fame. Uh, before his death in 2019, he was also presented with the Military Order of William by the Royal Family of the Netherlands in recognition of his actions you know, in Holland. Um, you know, he was able, after his military career, to come back to Pennsylvania, and he went back to the dairy industry that he had always wanted to be part of at the very beginning. So. <clears throat> so, again, we talk about Penn State connections, and you're running into folks no. You, you, you threw one's life. Um, Edward Bastian, you know, it was a Penn Stater who came here in 1936 to play baseball. Uh, he was excited two years later when his high school sweetheart, Helen Swanson, here joined him here at Penn State. Uh, but as so often happens with high school sweethearts in college, you know, they, they grew apart and went their separate ways. Uh, Ed Bastian led her twice in baseball was a standout on the team. You know, left Penn State and took a job in the steel industry. You know, you know, Helen, you know, while she was here at Penn State, met and fell in love with you know, Joe Odessa, who was one of our former football players and was coaching football at State, you know, State College High School. You know, you know, I will point out, and you can see her trophy for this you know, downstairs. You know, you know, Helen was named the you know, Campus Circus Queen in 1940. We had a number of pageants on campus back then. Um, I can tell you that um, Jack Reichenbach's wife was uh, the May Queen, I think, in 1939. <clears throat> They're great pictures to look at. Um, seeing the court, you know, it's, they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, you know, Joe and Helen were married. You know, when she graduated in 1942, and shortly thereafter, you know, he shipped out to join the Navy. You know, he spent his war driving landing craft in the Pacific. Uh, Eddie Bastian went to Italy with the 85th Infantry Division, served in the 403rd Artillery Battalion 
you know, and experience the, the slog that was the fighting on you know, up the Italian peninsula. Uh, with the end of the war, you know, you know Joe came home. You know, he and Helen had a wonderful life together. You know, two daughters, one of whom is right here. When he passed in 1978, um, you know, a couple of years later, you know, Helen actually ran into Ed, and they were, rekindled their romance. You know, that's why we see you know, that love came around for them. Um, rekindled their, their romance, and they ended up spending you know, the rest of his you know, rest of their lives. He passed in 1988 together. You know, and so it's we just had an incredible Penn State circle you know, with those three individuals. We've joked internally that as part of this project, we've come across any number of kind of Hollywood-worthy stories. Um, this was literally one, um, in every sense. Um, the individual here, Frank Leeson, you know, grew up as the son of a mine inspector out over towards Grant Wilkes Barre. Grew up around explosives, knew how to handle them. Came here to Penn State, you know, was a distinguished member of the wrestling team, you know, won a Eastern intercollegiate title, uh, uh, captain the team to a 7-1 record in 1941, you know, came in third at NCAAs. Uh, you know, with the U.S. entry into World War II later that year, <clears throat> you know, he had his ROTC commission activated. Ended up with the Army Corps of Engineers down in Washington, was bored out of his skull, pushing paper. When one of his fraternity brothers, a guy named Charlie Parker, called him and asked him if he was interested in joining this weird new organization he was part of called the Office of Strategic Services. And this was effectively the forerunner of the CIA. Parkin had him brought up to their training area in the Catoctin Mountains in Maryland, and Frank Spen the next year or so, teaching OSS agents and foreign partisans on how to do demolitions. You know, he was known for his infectious enthusiasm and, and loved teaching these folks how to create, you know, as he put it, quote, big boons. You know, in 1943, he received orders to actually ship out to China. This led to him establishing his own OSS camp you know, in, in the uh, you know, central part, you know, central part of China, you know, and in late in the excuse me, in the fall of 1944, he earned fame leading a detachment that, over the course of four months, destroyed 150 bridges, 36 river ferries, and a countless number of railroad locomotives and rolling stock. Um, for that effort, he received the Legion of Merit, but. The Hollywood component of this is the fact that his efforts were noticed by a reporter from Time Magazine named Theodore White. And White had, had run into Gleason, started following his detachment, watched what they were doing. And in, in, in addition to stories in Time Magazine, White wrote a nonfiction account of the campaign entitled Thunder, Thunder Out of China. That book, which was published in 1946, he later turned into a novel called The Mountain Road. In, uh, in 1958, and that novel, in turn, was made into a film entitled The Mountain Road, with Pennsylvania's own Jimmy Stewart effectively playing Frank Leeson. So, you know, if we have the picture there in the bottom corner, that is Jimmy Stewart effectively playing Frank Leeson in a, you know, you know, in a Hollywood film. If any of you have an interest in seeing it, the whole you can watch the whole thing on YouTube. I will admit it is not one of Jimmy Stewart's better efforts. <laughs> but it is one of the rare films he did that was set in a wartime environment. Um, but you know, it's, you're not going to find that in you know, you know, the canon of Jimmy Stewart's film career. It's, I, mean, I got through it, but I, I was doing it for work, so. <laughs> All right, and so I think we're going to skip ahead a little bit, you know, just as time is 
But moving along, you know, I, I can stand up and tell stories all day. And, and I'm going to lose tired of hearing them at this point. So if you're going to jump to the capital stuff, you know, we'll, we'll start to wind things down a bit. Uh, so, as we said at the beginning, we had over 1,200 you know, varsity, lettermen, and WRA student athletes that served during the war. Of that number, we lost 27 of them. Um, the, the casualties were, the bulk of the casualties were aviation related. You know, 16 of the 27. Only three of those 16 were due to enemy action. Uh, two, Richard Cuthbert and uh, Frederick Ernst were fighter pilots. Uh, Cuthbert was shot down in the Mediterranean, you know, Ernst over Japan. Now the third, uh, <coughs> You know, James Hartman was a B-17 pilot. His aircraft sustained a direct hit from a flak shell over Belgium and exploded in late 1944. Uh, the remaining 13, so nearly half of Penn State's losses during the war, were due to aviation accidents. I think we often think that flying in the 40s was pretty was fairly safe. It's fairly regular. Uh, that was very far from the case, especially with increasingly sophisticated military aircraft. Yeah, these accidents include everything from um, not returning from missions over water, mid-air collisions, uh, crashes that take off or landing. Um, the first Penn Stater lost during the war, Adam Kalamanovitz, you know, was lost in this manner. You know, he was a you know, uh, pilot flying an anti-submarine mission on a Long Island in, in May 1942, and his aircraft never returned. Um, you can find his name on the East Coast Monument in Battery Park, if, if you're ever in New York. Now, the first Nittany Lion to die in combat was Garfield Thomas, who we discussed earlier at the Battle of Cape Esperance. Now, the first in Europe was First Lieutenant Donald McGrail. Uh, he had won a Silver Star for his role in a raid in Tunisia a couple weeks before his death. Now, the last Penn Stater to die in Europe was uh, Second Lieutenant George Pittenger, you know, 20th Armored Division. You know, he was killed outside Munich on April 30th, 1945, so about a week before the end of the war. Uh, he received a Silver Star as well. Uh, his Sherman tank had been hit by a German Panzerfaust, kind of a German bazooka. Um, he was last seen alive on the machine gun on top of the turret trying to cover his crew's escape. Now, the last Penn Stater across the board to die in combat was the fighter pilot Frederick Ernst. You know, he was lost over Japan in July 1945. Now, our final casualty, and, and they're all tragic, but in this case the war was, was over by about three weeks. You know, it was you know, First Lieutenant you know, Edward Anderson. Now his you know, OA-10A Catalina is Army version of a PBY Catalina seaplane you know, crashed off the Azores in late September 1945. Uh, the 27 student athletes that we lost was about 2.2% about of those who served. Um, you know, that's, and that number, having done a little bit of research, it is in about line with the national average, depending, you can play with the numbers a little bit each way, but you know, on, you know, you're going to be between about two and a half and three and a half percent of all those who served, you know, died, or died you know, in some shape or form, or due to some cause. Um, so I just, we wanted to make sure that we put all 27 names up, you can learn about, a bit more about each one, you know, when we go downstairs. You know, obviously, you know, as the war started to wind down, you know, our student athletes began to transition either occupation duty or return to the United States. Um, for those who were assigned to occupation duty, um, they began to reorganize both Germany and Japan and rebuild those shattered countries. Uh, you know, in, in Germany, we had former student athletes who worked to aid displaced persons. We had one fellow who, if anyone saw the movie Monuments Men, about, you know, the, uh, about the museum professionals, we're particularly proud that we have one of these guys. Um, 
helped recover artwork in lost cultural property you know, across Europe. Uh, we had former student athletes who were assisting farmers get their farms back, back up and running. Back here at Penn State, you know, the university's leaders were beginning to figure out how to handle the post-war surge of veterans coming home. Uh, to, to the college's credit, President Hetzel began planning for this in 1944 with the aptly named you know, Committee on Post-War Problems. It does what it says in the label. You know, this group discussed everything from uh, veterans' admissions, building programs, housing, student support, you know, everything that would need to happen you know, to be able to accommodate veterans when they returned home. And this became a more pressing issue with the passage of the GI Bill, which provided you know, tuition support to veterans. You know, President Hetzel was very emphatic that for students coming to Penn State after the war, that first first priority be given to those former students who had left to join the military, that they be given the first chance to come back. You know, the plan that was put in place beginning in 1946 made sure that 75% of all admission slots at Penn State went to veterans, the other 25 to high school seniors. And the greatest challenge that faced Penn State at the time was how to house all of these veterans coming home. The solution was to build temporary dorms. You know, they went to the War Department, got surplus prefabricated barracks, got travel trailers. Uh, you can see some of the trailers in the bottom left here. It's, it's sort of like a FEMA trailer solution that we'd have today. Um, you know, while this measure solved the issue to some degree, uh, it did not completely eliminate it, and ultimately deals were done with what is now the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education, as well as a number of private schools in Pennsylvania that Penn State's freshmen would go to those schools for their first year. Uh, so beginning in the fall of 1946, if you were a Penn State freshman, you were going to be someplace else. Um, you know, the, you know, the arrival of veterans on campus also boosted the athletic program. Obviously, we're bringing back you know, a generation of students and athletes who were much more mature, much more physically developed. This led to national, national title for soccer in 1949, led to football going undefeated in 1947 and going to the Cotton Bowl. You know, and in the years after 1945, the sports that had been suspended during the war were ultimately brought back you know, in a phased manner. We did have some former athletes who, when they returned to campus, elected not to compete anymore. You know, they were at a point where they just wanted to get their lives moving forward. We also had some who came back, continued to train, and ultimately went to the Olympics. You know, Barney Ewell was one. Uh, you know, there were a couple other uh, others in the 1948 Olympic team you know, who were also of that age. So I think to wrap up, I would just like to say that you know, the Nittany Lions who answered the call during World War II you know, were forever changed by their experiences, you know, regardless of where they served. Um, like many veterans, you know, we found that they, a lot of them were very hesitant and reticent to, to speak about their wartime experiences, but you know, they certainly all represented the pride and determination and ideals that were given voice by you know, Sergeant Max Peters, and I think each could say you know, with a great deal of pride that you know, I am a Penn State.